Good morning, everyone. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Drew. <laughs> Steve cheated, he put his mic on. <laughs> well, it's great to see everyone in the house of the Lord this morning, and we do wanna welcome those joining us online. We're just so happy to be here, and uh, we're glad that you've come to worship with us. Before we get started, we're gonna read a passage from Psalm 40, verses one to three. It said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. This morning as we enter into worship, let's just put our trust in him. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above anything we could hope. And he never leaves us where we are. He's always helping us to transition into the people that he would have us to be. And as we enter into this time of worship, let's just prepare our hearts with prayer. If you would be willing and able, let's stand together. Dear God, we come to you this morning and we are just so thankful for the fact that you are able to meet our needs, to take care of us, Lord, to deal with the struggles in our lives, to make beauty from ashes. And God, I pray that you would continue to move among us. I pray that, Lord, you would lift us from the slimy pit, from the mud and the mire, and that we would remember that you have set our feet on the rock that you gave us a firm place to stand, that through the salvation that was given to us by Jesus, we have a firm foundation. We can trust you. We can sing praise authentically from our hearts to you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that this morning in a way that honors and glorifies you. Let the words of our lips, let the songs that we sing honor you and bring joy to you, Lord, because you are so worthy of all of our praise and all of our adoration, God, and we want to give it all to you this morning. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. So this morning we're going to do something uh, uh, <coughs> that we do periodically. Um, Josh Thatchik, who's one of the elders here, has asked uh, to be anointed. And so I'm going to ask Josh if he'll come. And the other elders, uh, if you're an elder, uh, you're welcome to join us if you would like to, if you would, please. Okay. So let me talk to you about anointing in Scripture. Um, thank you, uh, Reverend. I'm glad you're here. Um, you guys can have a seat if you'd like. Let me tell you about anointing in Scripture. Um, in the Bible, uh, in James chapter 5, James is talking to Christians like you and me. And he says this, he says, is any among you sick? He should call on the elders of the church to anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord and pray for him. And the prayer of faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. In there, he says um, that um, if we have sinned, we should confess our sins. And uh, if there's anything holding us back from uh, God hearing us or healing us, uh, we should we should talk to God about that and get that clean. The oil in Scripture is a, an emblem of the Holy Spirit. You may remember, although you weren't alive then, you probably read about it, when David, the king of Israel, <laughs> when he was just a boy, Samuel went and anointed him as king. And what Samuel was doing is he's pouring oil over this young, young boy, was saying, as this oil comes upon you, so the Spirit of God might rest on you in order to help you to, to be the king and rule wisely. So likewise, um, when we anoint someone with oil, we're asking the Holy Spirit of God to come and to heal them, to make them well. The same spirit that will quicken our mortal bodies, Paul says in the book of Romans, may he uh, do his work in Josh here today. This oil is not special. In fact, this is kind of funny. When I came to Kermansville Alliance, the first person that wanted to be anointed, I grabbed the oil that was there that they had been using, and it was oil, valve oil for a trumpet. And that's what we anointed with. And I'm like, oh, I might have grabbed the wrong one. Nope, they've been using this for years. I replaced that with olive oil, Bertoli, extra virgin. So we're in good shape. Okay, we're in good shape here. But it isn't the oil you understand. The oil is a symbol, just like the bread and the cup are a symbol of Jesus' body and blood. The oil is likewise a symbol of the Spirit of God who we're asking to help Josh and to make him well. Amen. And uh, I like where you're sitting, Josh. I'd like you to remain there, and uh, I'll come down here and join you guys. And we have the microphone, right? Josh, is there anything you'd like to say um, at all to the congregation? Okay. No. Okay. Great. So we're anointing you for healing. Do you want to talk about that at all? Uh, just some pain that will not let up in my upper back and neck. Okay. Whether it's an old injury rearing its ugly head again, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not really sure. I'm tired of taking pain pills. Okay. Okay. It, so. Okay. Great. So um, I'm sure you've dealt with God on this. There's nothing in your life that you feel would be holding you back from receiving this healing. Okay, great. So I would like to ask you, Kerwinsville Alliance, as the elders pray, we're gonna pass the mic around so that you can hear us. God hears us no matter what. And, and in your heart, you can say amen and amen because you love Josh, you care about him, and you want him to be well. And um, even if you'd like to, uh, as we're praying, if you wanna just hold your hand forward when that time comes, just to symbolically say, I'm laying hands on him as well. I want Josh to be well. Uh, I would invite you to do that if you feel comfortable doing that. Okay. <coughs> I'm gonna let Eric do the anointing. You good with that, buddy? Okay. Caught you cold there. Do you want me to do it? Uh, you probably need some direction. So you, I would just take the oil, I'd put it, if we had a gallon jug, we could use that. <laughs> I'd take it. <laughs> Did you hear him? I would take it. Yeah, it's beautiful. So I would just put a dab on his uh, forehead, and I would say, I know you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Before you do that, though, we're going to just pray a prayer of cleansing, so that if I have something in my heart, I can deal with that before God. And I invite you to join us in spirit as, as I lead in that prayer. Lord Jesus, all of us uh, struggle sometimes to live the lives we should live. All of us desire to be the people you want us to be. 
We come before you as individuals who rely on the work of Christ to make us well, spiritually and physically. We rely on you, Jesus, to have paid the price that our sins might be forgiven. And so we confess any sin. Maybe in the silence of our heart, we confess it specifically. We are sorry for this. We trust you to forgive us. We lean on 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This we do because we believe the prayer of a righteous man is effective. And the only righteousness we have is through you, Lord Jesus. This we pray in your name, amen. you Josh you're good Perfect. I anoint you Josh in the name of the Father of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Lord may you be with us Lord may you be with our brother Josh may you bring healing Lord may you tend to this pain that Josh is experiencing Lord, as we know, you are the ultimate healer. And we ask that you be with him, that you heal him completely and entirely. May you do it now, Lord. Lord, we trust in you to do this. We know that you can work in this way. Whether it be through the means of medical assistance or whether it be through your immediate touch, Lord, may you do it. We praise you, Father. We give you the glory, Lord, in all things. In this life, we experience many things. Some are difficult, and some are full of joy. We give it to you, Lord. We praise you in all things. In Jesus' name. God, what a privilege it is to kneel before you on behalf of our brother and our friend. Lord, I'm reminded of the woman who reached out in desperation to touch the hem of your garment in faith, and she was healed. And this morning we come before you in faith, asking God that you would heal Josh not only that you would relieve the symptoms, but you would dig out the source. Lord, that if something needs to be moved, Lord, that you would do that. Uh, Lord, if something needs to be changed in his body, that you would do that. God, we're asking you to do something that only you can do. And that's why we're asking you. So, Father, I pray that you would pour out your spirit, not in drops, not in gallons but in oceans on this man. Father, I know that physical pain can affect your mental state, your relationships, and so God, I pray that you would guard Josh, guard the words that come out of his mouth, block the thoughts that might creep into his mind that come from the enemy. Lord, I pray that he would walk in faith. We declare that you are our healer and so we invite you, we implore you, we beg you, Lord Jesus, that you would do this thing, that you would heal him, that he would have an incredible testimony to give, that he cried out to you, he reached out to you as best he could to touch the hem of your garment in faith. We pray these things. Father, we come to you this morning grateful for the ability to come before you today and ask on behalf of Josh for healing, to be able to speak to you directly, the great healer. We are so blessed, Father. We just lift him up to you today, Lord, and we, we ask that this pain that is in his neck, Lord, would be gone, that you would heal that, that you would take it away, that his mind would be clear, 
that is to, to be able to to uh, commune with you, God, in this moment, that he would be able to feel your presence in his body, that you would be able to, to heal him as we lift him up to you, Lord, as we know that you have the power to do, Lord, and we are so blessed to be able to uh, be, be with you this morning. Just pray that as Josh goes from here today, he will feel your presence in his body and his soul that everything that he does, every step that he takes, he will feel your presence with him as he goes from here today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Father, we're so thankful to be able to care for one another this way. Father, we would say these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that this pain would be gone in Christ's name, that the source of this pain would go to the place that you would send it, Jesus. That the enemy of our souls would not have any authority, but all authority would belong to you, <coughs> the great physician. In the name of Jesus. We would, we would speak in the name of Jesus and ask that any outcomes of this pain in the past that are negative would be undone. We would speak in the name of Jesus and we would ask that the only outcomes of this would provide for a greater good, that you would redeem this and bring blessing from it. We desire to see Josh whole and serving you with all his might. We ask humbly for your gracious hand in bringing this to pass through Christ Jesus the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Yep. You know the line, go in faith believing. <laughs> Dave, would you be willing to lead us in prayer? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful for the ability to come to you, that you hear our prayers, that you hear the concerns that are on our heart, the troubles that we have in our lives, the struggles that we have every day, Lord. You're there in those struggles. You're there in the blessings. Let us always be aware of your presence in our lives and, and look for it. May we reach out every day to speak with you, to... to uh, to give ourselves to you, Lord. Lord, I think of those that are traveling the world, our, our missionaries, Lord, and I just pray that prayer for them, that they would be able to feel your presence in every step that they take in their life. They would be able to spread that good news to those who have not heard it and to those that need to hear it clearly. Lord, I think of those that are struggling with medical conditions like Josh, Lord, and we lift them up to you today. We just pray for healing for them. We pray for uh, the, the, your presence in their lives as they heal. Lord, I think of this service today, and, and uh, I think of the message that Pastor Steve's going to bring us today, and I pray that our eyes and our ears and our hearts are open to the message that you have placed on his heart to give to each and every one of us today. May we take that knowledge and that message that you have for us and apply it to our lives to share it amongst the people that we come in contact with daily, Lord. Let us be a living example of your love and your, your compassion for the human race. Lord, we love you and we thank you for everything that you give us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 At this time, the children are dismissed if they'd like to go to Children's Church. And regarding anointing uh, with oil and prayer, if you have a physical need, James says, call the elders of the church and ask them to come and pray for you. And we have done that in hospital rooms, in nursing homes, in living rooms, around the kitchen table, um, outside in the yard. We've done that a hundred different places, and the elders will be glad to serve you in that capacity if you have that kind of need. Often, when we do it on Sunday morning, we do it at the close of the service. I asked Josh specifically if uh, he would mind if we did it during the service because I felt it would have 
meaning uh, to all of us who are gathered here. So thank you, Josh, for affording us that opportunity. Um, God is such a good father, isn't he? Amen. Amen. So you're looking at the screen, and the text says, what are you doing here? And that's a good question. What are you doing here? It's the question we're going to ask today as we look at Nehemiah chapter 3. So I'd ask you to open your Bibles to Nehemiah 3. Uh, we're going to look at the whole passage. We're not going to read that whole chapter, but we're going to look at the whole passage today. And if you're just joining us, if you haven't been with us uh, in the past several weeks, we are going through the book of Nehemiah a little bit at a time. Nehemiah was a guy who had um, um, a real desire on his heart to see the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt. And so he left and took a two-week journey from his home in Babylon to go to Israel, to Jerusalem. The walls had been destroyed there by enemies long beforehand. The gates were all burned. The place was pretty much a train wreck. And he is there, and finally in chapter 3, he is ready to begin the work of rebuilding the walls. And this past week, it occurred to me, I've been there. I've been to Israel twice. I've been to Jerusalem twice. And when I was there, I took some pictures of the walls. Now, you're looking at that picture, and you're saying, I sat too far back, and I can't help you with that. But you're, as you look at it, you see the, the stone that's down in the front of the sign there. And the, the sign says, if you could read it, it says, Jerusalem in the first temple period, 1000 to 586 B.C. So those were the first walls that were built around Jerusalem there in 1000 B.C., and they lasted until... Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylon, Babylonians came and knocked them down. That's what's left of those walls. The, the picture here kind of shows how high they are, and you really can't see it, but do you see the window in the building on the left? That's probably eight to 10 meters above the, the ground there, above the, the, you see the stone path? It's not really a path, it's the top of what's left of the wall. That's probably how high they were, was as high as that window uh, in the building, the window on the left that's there. Um, and uh, Nehemiah evidently didn't repair this part of the wall. He might have made the city somewhat smaller and left this go. Or if he did repair it, it was knocked down again. Uh, I'm not really sure of that. Um, if I recall correctly, there you can see the wall going the other way. You might be thinking, so how wide is that? And I would have felt comfortable driving a golf cart on there, but I, wouldn't taken, I would not have taken um, Preston Keister's F-250 on there. As good as a big a truck. Is that what you're driving now these days? What do you got now? A Volkswagen Beetle? What has happened to you? <laughs> what are you driving right now, Preston? A Dodge, a Dodge what? Yeah, yeah uh, one ton, is that what you, how, yeah. As, as good as that Dodge is, I wouldn't take it on there. I don't think you would fit, but you would fit well. Maybe in my Honda, Hyundai Santa Fe, that would work on there. So that kind of gives you a picture of those walls. And uh, yeah, take a, a golf cart, but it would be bumpy. Now, we're going to read this passage in bits and pieces in a little bit. But I want to tell you up front, um, I find this to be an odd passage of Scripture. Because what you have in this passage of scripture, this chapter, is kind of a list of names of people who worked and where they worked. And it's one after another, after another, after another. Um, look at it. Look at verse 1, if your Bible's open to there. Look at verse 1. It says, Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated as far as the Tower of Hanel. My life has changed. Oh, the reading of God's Word has changed my life. Yours as well? It's kind of a weird thing, right? It feels a little blasphemous for me to say that, but hang in there, I'll be okay. Okay. Yeah, what, what, the so what question comes into your mind when you read that. Well, let's keep reading. Look at verse 2. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakur, the son of Im Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the son of Hesanaah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshumlam, son of Barakiah, son of Meshezabel, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Baanan, also made repairs. Those are some extraordinary names doing some extraordinary things. But it's kind of weird. What am I going to get out of that? 
let's go to verse 5. The next section, in fact, verse 5 does stand out to me. Listen as I read it. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Now, I went to Tekoa Falls College. That's in Georgia. This Tekoa is in the Middle East. It's a different place. But did you catch what it said? It said the men, the next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisor. Hmm. You can see that Nehemiah, he dealt with some different kinds of people. The nobles of Tekoa wouldn't do the work. Let's skip ahead. Let's look at verse 8. Uziel, son of Herahiah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. And Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Rephaiah, son of Hur, ruler of the half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. So, okay, I can see we got some guys here, a goldsmith, a perfume maker. These are guys who are not accustomed to getting their hands dirty, and they're getting their hands dirty. That's pretty cool. Skip down to verse 12, please. It says, Shalom, son of Halahesh, ruler of the half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. How cool is that? So men and women both were working on this kind of uh, project. And then it goes on for the rest of the chapter, pretty much using phrases like this. This person did this, and next to him, that person did that. And along with him, that person did that. And next to them, that person did that. And after them, that person did that. And it just goes on and on, except for verse 27. Look at verse 27. Next to them, the men of Tekoa repaired another section from the great projecting tower to the wall of Orphi, Orpho. Wow. So those men of Tekoa, whose nobles wouldn't put their, their shoulder to the task, those men not only did the work that they were doing to begin with, but they went on and did even more. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, Pastor Steve, I didn't like it when you said sarcastically, my life has changed by the reading of this. I get that. But think about it. What in this passage really speaks to your heart? There are some things. But, but it's kind of hard to see them. And, and we know they're there, though, because Paul says to Timothy that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All Scripture is good for teaching. It's good for rebuking. It's good for correcting. It's good for training in righteousness. How? How does this passage fit that description of Scripture? Well, if you follow along, I'll show you some ways. One way is, and some useful lesson that it gives, one way it teaches us is that all kingdom work is spiritual work. Now, someone may think incorrectly, they may think, well, you know, when you preach a sermon or when you participate in Sunday school or when you lead a small group or when you study the Bible with others, that's spiritual work. But when you volunteer to bring food to the teens, or when you repair a leak in the roof, or when you make coffee for the people, or when you deliver audio to the shut-ins, that's not spiritual work, that's just practical work. That's wrong. If it is done for the kingdom, it is spiritual. Look at verse 1. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate, they dedicated it and set its doors in place as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated and as far as the Tower of Hanel. When it says they dedicated it, that tells you that as they built this and went along with it, they got to a point where they would stop and they would say, this is done. We dedicate this, I don't know, maybe they had a prayer where they said, God, we dedicate this project to you for your glory and for your honor and for the protection of, of we, your sheep, your people, that the enemy would have no place here. God, may you use the work of our hands. It was not just a practical thing that had to be done. It was a spiritual thing. And whether you are leading worship at a wedding, that happened recently, right? 
or you're shoveling snow at the church, or you're giving a neighbor a ride to a doctor's appointment. If it's kingdom work, it's spiritual in nature because all kingdom work is spiritual work. That's the first useful lesson here. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. There's a second useful lesson here, and, and that is that distraction doesn't have to deter you from serving in the kingdom. Verse five, we read it earlier, it's about those guys from Tekoa. Do you remember it says, the next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. That could have been a distraction for the men who were putting their shoulders to the work. I mean, I can almost imagine the uproar and the anger about it. I can imagine a march. We are going to march against the nobles of Tekoa. We need to have them unseated. Perhaps we could impeach them. Can we do that? But that's not what happened. The people of Tekoa did not allow themselves to be distracted from kingdom work. They did it. And by the way, they did a lot of work. You saw 22 verses later, they finished that job, and then they went on to do another section from one tower to another wall. They let nothing deter them or distract them. Leaders, the nobles of Tekoa among them, they can kind of let you down sometimes. I mean, there's probably not anyone that's been in church more than five years that hasn't kind of discovered that, well, that guy, he wasn't what I thought he was. I mean, I've had so many authors and pastors that I followed, preachers that I followed through podcasting, and then all of a sudden it's like, what happened to them? What happened to them? Wow, they weren't who we thought they were. And I've had that on a more personal level with people I knew and respected. They weren't who I thought they were. And that can really distract from kingdom ministry you probably know, I know, I know, people who saw leaders behaving poorly and just cashed it in and said, I don't believe any of this stuff anymore. It happens. But it's not just, in my mind, it's not just leaders who can distract you from serving in the kingdom. In fact, probably more often and much more relevant to you and me is money can distract me from the kingdom, not so much getting it, but using it. An opportunity can distract me from the work of the kingdom. And I really believe that's why Jesus says to his disciples, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's not that the money keeps you out, it's that the blessings and the opportunities and all the things you can use it for and all the things you can do with it distract you from the work of the kingdom. The lesson from Nehemiah 3, don't let anyone or anything distract you from the work of the kingdom. Let me give you another useful lesson. Everyone has a place in the kingdom. You might need to work to find it. I did. But there's a place for you in the kingdom. Every now and then, someone will visit uh, the church and they'll hear me, hear me preach, and for reasons that I will never understand, they will say something like this on the way out the door. Wow, Steve, you're a natural. I know you don't understand why anyone would say that after hearing me preach either, do you, right? I am not a natural. I am not a natural. I've come to the place where I am quite comfortable doing public speaking. It feels natural to me now, but I didn't like the idea at first. In fact, when I was in high school, along about a senior or so, and they're saying, what are you gonna do for a living? I had in mind that I would like to have a career in broadcast radio. I wanted to be a DJ. That would be really nice. I'd like to do that. My mother thought about that, and she had it in her mind that I should be a preacher. Can you imagine that? And listen to what she said as she gaslighted me. <laughs> My mom said to me, Steve, if you're working in broadcast radio, you will be called upon to go out and speak. You'll have to be at a store opening or maybe a ribbon cutting or introducing someone who's going to speak in a political situation. And I know you don't like public speaking. Now, in the meantime, she's praying that I'll become a preacher. Okay. 
I know you. And you know what? That was it. I just put a, a, a stone, a cemetery stone on that idea and said, radio broadcasting, you are dead to me. I'm not going to do that. Because in myself, I didn't see myself ever engaging in public speaking. But look where I am every Sunday. I found this place in the kingdom. It took a little work. It took a lot of experimentation. It took a lot of patience on the part of the people. But yeah, here it is. You see, the Bible says that God gives each of us gifts, not just me, not just your Sunday school teacher. Everyone is the language that's used in Paul's epistle to the church at Corinth. He gives gifts to every one. Some he makes evangelists, some he makes teachers, some he, he makes administrators and overseers, some he just gives them this gift to be a great encourager, to just make people say, that was great what you did, I'm so glad you did that. Some he makes into shepherds and pastors, some he, he makes them into helpers who can get the coffee ready and clean it up afterward. Some he makes into teachers. And as you serve in the kingdom, you kind of learn your gifting. And as you learn your gifting, you live your gifting. <coughs> However, and this is a part that I really need you to hear, there are times that each of us is called to act outside of our giftings and our natural talents. There are times that I need to act outside of my gifting and do the work of the kingdom that's right in front of me. I hate bookkeeping, but I have to put together some bookkeeping to do the annual report here with my assistant in the, in the next few days that are ahead of us. It's not my gift, but it's the work of the kingdom. It's right in front of me. God has places for you in the kingdom, places for which he has gifted you and places where you just need to serve because the work is done. What I want you to know is everyone has a place in the kingdom. Now, this phrase is awkward, but I can't think of how to say it. Hearts of passion serve regardless, regardless. So what's your passion? Knowing your passion may give you an inkling of where you should maybe begin to explore serving, where you should start serving. Have you ever noticed how often people volunteer to serve in places where their children are? You know, some people, some people coach a sport because they love the sport, they love the idea of coaching, and they love the, the players. But there are other people who coach because their child is playing that year, and when a child moves on, so do they. That's fine and dandy. I think that's great. The, the same happens in the church. Preschoolers, uh, people who have preschoolers, I should say, they kind of like working with preschoolers. And then when that preschooler goes into grade school, then they want to be involved in that age group ministry. And then junior high comes along, they want to be involved there. And then senior high comes along, and, and, they, and they follow them right up to the empty nest. And I think that's fine and dandy. That's good thinking, I think. That's great. It's kind of what happens in Nehemiah, that where your interests are, that's where you're serving. If you read the chapter, you see the people, they over and over again, we're not going to read the chapter, but over and over again, you see the people repaired the wall that was nearest to their house. What section of wall should I work on? I think I'll work on a wall right near my house here. I mean, verse 10, the first part of it says, adjoining this, Jedediah, son of Haramaph, made repairs opposite his house. It's right there, taking care of it right here. It's a pattern. Every works everyone works close to their house. But I am sure <laughs> that was not the only part of the wall that Jedediah, or Jediah, was interested in. Fortifying the wall nearest your own house and just doing that and only being interested in that would not only be selfish, it would be self-deceptive and self-destructive because all it takes is one weak spot in that whole wall and the whole city is overrun. So I want to repair the wall right next to my house, but I'm really interested in the whole kingdom, the whole wall, all of it I'm interested in because if there's a hole over across on the other side of town, we're all toast. So your passion, it needs to reach beyond your interests, beyond your personal interests, right into the interests of the kingdom. 
If you go home today and read this entire chapter, you'll see there were people who worked on vast portions of the wall, and they did it entirely for the kingdom. They are Judy Kim, loving babies in the nursery, although her children are adults. They are Eric Rolls with the young guns every Sunday morning. They are Milton McDonald driving teens to yet another <laughs> retreat or event. They are Brandon, Indiana, speaking about relationships that replenish. They are Sharon Robinson, <laughs> who's 29 years of age and has been teaching for five or six decades, <laughs> teaching little children that are not her own for decades. She said something like this to me recently. She said, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of old, maybe I should stop this, but I love teaching these children. She's kingdom-minded, and her interest is beyond her own yard and her own house and her own wall right outside her house. Her interest is in the kingdom. Men of Tekoa rebuilding a stretch of wall, yet another one. They're kingdom people. They're serving sacrificially. Kingdom people have an interest in their part of the kingdom, the wall right behind their house, and they have an interest in the entire kingdom, every aspect of it, because hearts of passion serve regardless, regardless. The fifth lesson is this. There is honor serving in the kingdom. It is an honor to serve, and you are honored as you serve. There are probably a lot of reasons that chapter 3 is here in Nehemiah. I think one of the big reasons is that the Holy Spirit of God breathed these words, all scripture is God breathed, breathed these words, breathed these words because he wanted to honor these people for the work they had done. And being honored, <laughs> that gives your work meaning. We all look for recognition in our work. Every time my wife and I are leaving Pittsburgh, headed out toward the airport, we come out of the Fort Pitt Tunnel, we go up the road there uh, to, uh, toward the airport, we get up there, uh, I can't think, Greens, Greensburg, that's what, Green Tree, that's Green Tree up there. And, and then we get to Camel Run Road, and I say to my wife, I say, oh, look at that, there's Camel Run Road. I, this pavement we're on, I worked on this job. I worked on this job one summer, right here. This is my exit. This is, this is mine. And my wife will so patiently say, I know, honey, you tell me every time we drive here. <laughs> you see, being pleased with your work and seeing honor in it has meaning, but the honor you get from being part of a work crew on a highway and the honor you get from serving in the kingdom are two different things. One of them, wow, is huge. One of them is huge. Being honored by God, it doesn't just give work meaning, it gives your life meaning. This is a sad reality, but there is nothing that I know of apart from the kingdom that you can be sure is worth your investment. It doesn't mean you shouldn't invest in other things, but there is nothing that I know of apart from the kingdom that you can be certain is worth your investment. You can pour yourself into your job for years and go in next week and find that your employer is letting you go. It happens. You can give yourself to your family, and you should, and you should, but there are parents all around you who will affirm that there are no guarantees on how that will turn out. You can invest your life in having fun, in hobbies, in recreation, in sports, in gaming, in travel. But if you neglect kingdom investment as you do that, you will find yourself emptier and emptier and emptier. Just ask the author of Ecclesiastes. He'll fill you in on that. But when you give attention to the kingdom, you find meaning in the life you live. You sense the pleasure of God. I sense the pleasure of God right now, right now. 
you sense the pleasure of God. You, you see a change in your own heart as you're working to help others. It's just a divine thing that happens when you're serving in a kingdom. And if you're really, really, really privileged, you'll see a change in the hearts of others as well. And you feel this honor that God gives those who give themselves to serve the kingdom. So let's go back to our earlier question. How does a list of names have value? All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So how do I get value from this passage? Well, first, you get value from this passage by choosing to value the service that God has called you to in the kingdom. You know, occasionally, you might look at other people who have a similar gifting to your own, and that may seem that God has given them a more important role in the kingdom than you have. And I have struggled with that. I used to struggle with that a lot. Like, I, I live in a town that has two and a half stoplights. That's me. And I have friends from college who aren't as smart as me and maybe I don't think are quite as gifted as I. And I'm not saying this arrogantly. I just, when I look at it, I'm kind of like, really? And they have four stoplights in their town. <laughs> Some of them fly around on jet airplanes. One of them, I'm not even sure he's a Christian, pastoring, got to pray with the president of the United States of America. Two and a half stoplights. Huh. I value their service, but when I was younger, that used to really bother me. But I have come to the place that I know where I belong, and I belong right here. Right in this kind of role. Right in rural Pennsylvania right in a town with two and a half stoplights, and I wouldn't trade being where God wants me to do for anything else, anything else. And when I stop comparing what God has for me to do with what he has for someone else to do, when I let go of that and value the role has given to me in the kingdom, I gain great personal profit from that. Great profit from that. So look at what God has you to do, value it, and do it. Be satisfied in serving him, even when it's hard to do so. This passage profits us by reminding us to avoid forces that would deter you from serving. I love the fact that while the nobles of Tekoa refused to serve the men of Tekoa, they're mentioned twice for the work they did. God invited them to serve in the kingdom, and they let nothing distract them. Is there something distracting you from what you would do in the kingdom, what you know God has you to do in the kingdom? Man up and deal with it. Deal with it. Avoid forces that would deter you from serving. And try some things. Find your place in the kingdom. There's no evidence that Nehemiah went in and said, okay, you, I want you to work over there, and you, I want you to work over there. It, it would seem, he might have done that, but it would seem that each person found their own place and worked there. And honestly, the best way for you, you to find your place is maybe to give something a try. And it'll probably have to do with something that you're passionate about. In his book, Wishful Thinking, Fred, Nick, Frederick Buchner writes this. He says, and, and listen to this. This is a great quote. I'm going to read it twice. It's on the screen. Listen to it. The place God calls you to is a place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. I love that. It, it, it sounds profound. It sounds a little mystical. It sounds beckoning. It sounds even romantic. The place that God calls you to is a place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. I like that statement. I, I respect that statement. But I know that the place that God called these people to in Nehemiah chapter 3 was a hot, dusty, 
desolate, deserted city where the walls had been destroyed years earlier and the gates had been burned years before. And so in these hot, dry, miserable conditions, their deep gladness was marked by sweat. It was marked by fingers being smashed between rocks. It was marked by people making fun of them and jeering at them and people even threatening their very lives. (laughs) The place God calls you to is a place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Deep gladness for you, it may be made up of dysfunctional families, uncertainty, people who just don't get it, even something as traumatic as dirty diapers in a nursery on your shift. (laughs) Doesn't matter. You have a place in the kingdom. Find it. This passage profits us by telling us to look for something to care about. I like it better to say, look for someone to care about. Look for someone to care about. The people found something to care about. It was a wall adjacent to their house. Uh, That wasn't pure selfishness, it was practicality. Uh, Find something better, someone to care about. And I say someone because the kingdom isn't made up of things. This building, I love it. It serves us well. This is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom is not hardware, it's software. It's people. So look for people to care about. It could be the aging. It could be children. It could be your peers, your friends. It could be a woman's ministry. It could be teens. It could be a men's ministry. It could be helping people with special needs. Just ask God, how can I serve the interests of the kingdom by serving these people. This passage is incredibly useful, isn't it? This passage is useful because it tells us, look for honor from God, no one else. I wanna tell you, I'm sure that it felt good to finish building that wall. Don't you imagine what it felt like when they laid the last few stones? I'm, I'm, I'm imagining they all gathered around together and say, right over here is where it needs to be done. And they chipped in and they did it. And, and you know, there's some people just standing like, wow, wow, it's done. And I had to just be so fantastic to feel that. But, but I believe this with all my heart. I believe that standing there, as glorious as that would be, it must be kind of cool to be in heaven right now and look down and say, hey, Pastor Steve just read my name because it's in the Bible and he pronounced it all wrong, but my name's in the Bible. How cool would it be to be honored by God by him taking a chapter and putting your name and what you did in it? That would be so cool. Let me tell you something. He promises to do that. He promises to do that in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. The writer says, God is not unjust. He will not forget the work and the love you have shown him as you helped his people and continue to help them. God will honor you as you prioritize the kingdom. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? You know, if you're a Christ follower, your answer should be, what am I doing here? I am here on behalf of the king. That's what I'm doing here. I am here to do the work of the kingdom. I I am an alien in this world. I'm a citizen of heaven. And I am here because I pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I don't just say it, I'm living it. I am doing it. I am here because I want to get it done. That should be the natural perspective of someone who has come to a place in their life where they recognize the value of the sacrifice of Christ. When you come to the place in your life where you see something is wrong with you, something is wrong in your heart, and you look at God and you say, God, I I hate this sin. I'm so sorry for it. And you recognize that Jesus died on the cross to pay your sin, pay for your sin. And you say, God, I believe Jesus died for me. I trust him. Would you please forgive me? I will follow you. This is your response. This is the expected response. This should be the natural response of someone who has surrendered their life to Christ. The, respect, the response 
and perspective of a person who is saved. I have that perspective, generally. <laughs> Every now and then, all the things we talked, all the warnings we talked about, I think all of us sometimes fail to heed them. I want to pray that all of us would have that perspective as we conclude our time this morning. If you're comfortable doing so, let's stand together and we'll pray. So I'm going to move back into PowerPoint, so let's wait for the song for a minute, okay? So I just want you to look at this list real quick. And I want you to talk to God as we pray. I want you to say, God, I value the fact that I have a role in a kingdom. And I want to live as though I value this. I want to avoid forces that distract and deter me from saving, serving. And I know part of it is there's just so many opportunities for me because I am so stinking rich. You know you're richer than 95%, maybe 99% of the people in the world. It's a high number, whatever it is. God, I, I don't want those things to distract me and deter me from serving in a kingdom. Please forgive me for allowing that and don't let me allow that. I want to find my place in the kingdom and I want to try some things, maybe some things that are new. I, I want someone to care about for the sake of the kingdom. I, I desire to be honored by you and you alone, God. So that's what we're going to pray this morning. Let's bow our hearts together. Father, you've been so good to us by sending your son to die on our behalf. Jesus, <coughs> your love for us, laying down your life for a friend is overwhelming to us. Spirit of God, we're so thankful for your presence in our life. I pray, Father, that you will work in our hearts today to help us see that our lives can be rich with meaning and that you would open our eyes to the world around us and show us our, our role in your kingdom. For Christ's sake, amen.
So before you go, three things. Number one, I just looked and over 30 men and boys have signed up for the men's breakfast. Amen? That's just phenomenal. So uh, if you haven't signed up, sign up sheets near the elevator. Make sure you do that. Number two, I wonder what number two was. Oh, <laughs> so the uh, Sunday night small group that's studying doctrine, we will meet tonight at 630. So you're welcome to join us if you'd <laughs> like to do that. And number three, I asked one of our teens, Louis Thatchik, if he would conclude our time in prayer. Louis? God, thank you for um, this opportunity to experience you and just feel your peace and hear you work. You are so good to us. Be with us this week. Um, give us the courage to do what you call us to do because we are so weak without you. You are so good. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go. You are perfect.